Good afternoon and welcome to a program from the Jerry Bartlett Memorial Angling Collection at the Phoenicia Library. We're in the backyard today of the library in our native plant garden. The angling collection is just upstairs. It it's, looks like a rustic fishing cabin and it contains more than 800 books, memorabilia, and other information about cats, the, the history and tradition of fly fishing in the Catskills. We also have a lend -a rod program. If you have a library card, you can check out a fly rod or spinning rod. And um, we, we host a series of programs to help preserve the tradition and culture of, of fly fishing in the Catskills. Those programs are archived on our website which we'll post at the end of this, but I'll tell it to you now if you want to write it down. It's catskillanglingcollection.org. So um, in addition to me, we have a crew here. We have Brett Berry from, what's it called again? <laughs> Silver Hollow Audio. Silver Hollow Audio. <laughs> One day you'll remember that. <laughs> we have Stephanie Blackman, who does our web posting and designed our flyers. We have Mark Lodi, who's the current president of the Ashokan Papacton Watershed, Watershed chapter, chapter of Trout Unlimited. Very good. A professional photographer and a licensed guide. And we have our guest, our honored guest, Preston Woolheater. Uh, we, we are presenting this today live on Zoom. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat and we will ask them at the end of the program. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening to us today and welcome. And I'll turn it over to Mark Lodi. Okay, thanks for that introduction, <laughs> Beth. And thanks uh, to our public for joining us. So we're here today with uh, Preston Wallheater. And Preston is considered uh, one of the very tip-top uh, master fly tires, the trout fly tires here in the Catskill Mountains, tying in the Grand Catskill tradition. And we can say he ties in the Grand Catskill tradition because he learned to tie from Ray Smith. Uh, Ray Smith was one of the iconic fly fishing guides, fly tires, fly designers. Ray was born in 1900. He died in 1975. And between that time, he uh, taught a number of people uh, how to tie flies in, in the Catskill tradition, in his style. But he was very selective about who he taught. And it was primarily the kids in the neighborhood, one of which was our guest today, Preston Woolheater. Preston was born in 1955 and uh, befriended Ray at an early age. Was actually, uh, he was born in Kingston, lived in Phoenician, Mount Tramper, and was actually at one point Ray's neighbor in Mount Tremper. Ray took him under his wing when he was, what do you say, 10 years old, 11 10, years old? About 10 or and saw him how 11. So this person has perfected the fine art and craft of Catskill fly tying for 50 years now. So <laughs> that's a lot of history. So we'd like to hear from um, Preston um, what his experiences was with Ray Smith. So first of all, Ray Smith, born 1900, died in 1975. Master fly fishing guide, guided, or at least rumors that he guided Babe Ruth, Ted Williams, some of the radio stars of the day, uh, Fred Allen of the Fred Allen Radio Hour, um, and was basically the godfather of Esopus Creek fly fishing from the 1940s, maybe the post-war years, really up until his death. Tell us about Ray. What do you remember about Ray? What, why was he such a master fly tire? Well, I don't know why he was such a master tire. He learned when he was really young, I think. He uh, had, his father had chickens out in the backyard, and he used to use the chickens for tying, go out and tie the flies with the chickens and catch fish. And back then, the fishing was really good around here, I guess. And he just kept going with it, and uh, he tied for Folkerts. It used to be Folkerts. He tied for Wagners before it was Folkerts in Phoenicia here. And he tied a lot of flies for those people over the years. And, he was really good to all the kids in the neighborhood. He loved kids, and he loved teaching kids how to tie flies. He taught a bunch of kids that I know, and not too many of them are tying anymore. Just like my kids, I taught my kids, and you know, you, you have to love it. 
just a, you know, it's just it, one of those things you just have to have a real passion for it, which I still do. Um, so it's a labor of love for Ray, and it's apparently a labor of love for you. Yeah. What kind of guy was Ray? Was he easy to get along with? Oh, uh, very easy to get along with. Very, very funny, comical guy. Always kidding around. And, but he got serious about the fly tying, and he, I watched him for probably quite a few weeks before I actually took over and tied a fly. <clears throat> and my first fly that I tied was a dark Cahill dry fly. I don't have it. I wish I still did, but it turned out really good. And after that, he had me tying flies all the time there, because I did such a good job. And uh, and then over the years, he got me into Folkerts selling them flies. So I started with them, and back then, I think flies were going for like 25 cents a piece. I remember right. And now they go for what? Three dollars and $3 twenty-five cents a piece. And up for yeah. a fly. So it's come a long ways. And a lot of the things that we use for materials today have come a long ways. When we first started tying flies with Ray, this is what the hackle looked like. They used to come from India. And we used to get them from India. Now these are the, actually, the referred these to the capes of the necks. Is this of off the, the back of the rooster? And it took two or three of these hackles to make one fly. And we should explain the hackle is the feather that's wrapped around it's the hook that represents the legs. makes the hackle for the dry fly so that it floats. And that represents the legs of the insects that we are right. imitating. And today, with the ingenuity of breeding and genetics, this is what the hackle looks like today. And each one of these feathers can make anywhere between eight and ten flies. And uh, I get them from a company out in Colorado, Whiting Farms. And they have right now over 100,000 chickens there. And they hatch almost every day. They have hatches coming out of the, the hatchery. Um, they have three of them there. And each, each one holds about 8,200 eggs. So they're just cranking them right out. And they can't keep up with them. I talked to them the other day and they are very low on these feathers right now. They just, the demand is so great for fly time feathers. So this is referred to as genetic hackle, and it's specifically genetically engineered uh, both for color and also for the, the quality of the feather, the consistency, the firmness, the quality of the right. stem. The stems are very, very fine on these feathers, which means when you go to wind them on the hook, they don't twist over on you and roll over, and they make such a really nice fly. And here's a, here's a grizzly hackle, the same, same type of a thing right there. But they're just top quality. And grizzly refers to refers to the pattern. Grizzly. You notice this, this pattern is, is alternating dark and light, which uh, may well represent right. the light pattern mm -hmm. shining through the wings of a mayfly. Right, they come from the barred rock rooster. But fly tines come a long ways. I only have a couple of things, actually one thing that Ray gave me from after he died. His wife Bertie invited me up one day and she said, take whatever you want. I said, well, I want the vice. She said, no, somebody's already got the vise. <laughs> I couldn't get the vise, so she, I took these. These are a pair of hackle pliers that Ray had somebody make them. And huh. they're, they're so strong. I, I remember when I was a kid, I couldn't even get them open. Oh, my gosh. You want to try this? They will, no. not, they will not let go of a feather. Wow. So this would be used to grasp the end of the feather. And then you can twist, it's right. an implement by which you can it. twist right. the feather around the hook, creating the hackle. Yeah. Another trick that Ray found out about, I don't know, this goes way back. It's this fine copper wire, like hair. And this, what I have in my hand is a coil out of a Model T Ford. <laughs> oh, get out here. And this is the only place you can get them. <laughs> really? And that's used for what? This I use on. Uh, when I make a peacock body, I counterwind the copper wire in the opposite direction. And if the fish has sharp teeth, they'll cut the, the peacock feather, but the copper wire holds it all together. Or if you make a quill body, you do the same thing, and it keeps it from breaking up, and it makes the fly last a lot longer. I've had this spool for 50 years, and that, that's, there's a lot left on there. Like, can was... you pass it around? I want to see this thing. 
So this is probably came from one of the last Model Ts around yeah. <laughs> 50 years well, ago. I, I have I have more of it. I, somebody found a coil at an antique oh show. Oh my goodness, really? that and, is and so coils fine. Coils were made in a wooden box. Uh huh. So th this would actually not even be seen on the fly you by can't the see fish. It at all. And that's related to how fine it is. Right, but it's this, it's strong. This is about as thick as a hair, maybe. It's about a hair. But look yes. how closely they it? wound those together it. on there. Feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's copper. Amazing. It's copper. Mm -hmm. But Ray turned me on to that. This is such an interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. a great indication of the the deep history behind this this Casco yeah. style of fly fishing, out of a Model <laughs> T yeah. Ford. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Another thing, Ray always used a whip finish. But he never had a whip finish tool. I'm not even sure if a whip finish tool was available back then. But you did it all by hand. Um, today they make a whip finish tool to tie the fly off. But I still do it the way Ray taught me. And the whip finish is uh, uh, basically a series of overhand knots that secures the thread yes. at the top of the fly. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's just one of the things that I'll never forget. Another thing Ray was really kind of famous for around here was he always sold the wet fly leader sets with three wet flies on them and they've still become they're coming back because when I first started tying wet flies were a real popular thing and if you go back to the Theodore Gordon days I guess they were very popular because that was before dry flies really and then nymphs didn't come around nymphs weren't around much when Ray was teaching me but they are now. Nymphs are a big thing, but wet flies are coming back. But those three wet fly leaders were very popular. I sold a lot of those over the years. And two things, what were the actual flies in the three fly brace? They were wet flies. Can you identify the flies? Oh, you can put whatever you want on them. Okay. Um, I always put a lead wing coachman on every one of them. That was the tail end fly. Then uh. you put a gold rib hare's ear or an orange fish hawk, or a brown hackle, or a light cahill, or a claret gnat, whatever you want. Uh -huh. You can mix them up. Uh -huh. But the nice thing about those was you never really lost them because the leader was very heavy. Because uh -huh. it had to stay out stiff so it wouldn't twist around the line. And that's because they weren't tied in line, they were tied on a dropper. So each, right. one, each one came from a dropper, a dropper yes. off the main line and right. the three of them. Yeah. Yep. Yep, but they're, they're coming back. They're selling more and more of them right here in the store in Phoenicia. Piece of Catskill history, what goes around comes around. Yes, yeah, if, if you <laughs> okay. wait long enough, it'll come back. <laughs> okay. and, uh, Do you still fish, Preston? Not as much as I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? You're too busy tying flies? Too busy working. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'd like to, I, I haven't that. actually been out for a couple of months, but I, I gotta get out. The water's really starting to get nice now. It was high for a few weeks and um, it, it's it's getting back to where I like it. So, you know, I, I love the dry fly fishing and wet fly fishing. It's running about 500 CFS today. Is it? Uh, down at Cold Brook. Uh -huh. Eminently fishable. Well, I like fishing the small streams too, you know, they're a lot uh, of fun. Now you live on the Stony Clove Creek, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you take a lot of fish out of the Stony Clove? I don't keep any fish really. I take a couple a year right. maybe to eat, but I catch a lot of fish out of there, yeah. 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 One of the celebrated uh, feeder streams of the yeah. Surface Creek that has been fished since right. the early 1800s. Yeah. Right. Yeah, if you they, read the old stories, what they used to catch out of that stream, it's it's sickening. I mean, they'd go out and catch 300 fish a day. Yeah. All brook, brook trout, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Very different from today. Well, yeah. that was the location of the first boarding house in 1830 that catered to fishermen was right Milo up here. Milo Barber's. Milo Barber's right. farm, yeah. yeah. We, we have We're, good good evidence that was the first fishing resort in America. Yeah, really. And uh, we have numerous newspaper clippings uh -huh. from 1830s, 40s, about yeah. so-and-so judge came up from Kingston, caught 300 fish before breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Very different from today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I still love to tie flies, I'll tell you. It's just one of those things I enjoy doing. It's very relaxing. I don't watch much TV, and I'd rather tie flies. Well, I was intrigued by the fact, uh, because uh, um, Preston has a very uh, interesting, informative, and entertaining video on YouTube, which I watched, and you mentioned that uh, you come from, from a hard day's work, 
uh, you see it set up your fly tying bench, you put on your headphones, you listen to music, and you, you sort of bliss out. What kind of music do you listen to? Uh, kind of old country music, not the new stuff. The old I knew stuff. it. I knew it. <laughs> the, old, the old country music. George Jones, you know, Tammy Wynette, Conway Twitty, Hank Williams. Yeah. The classic. That, yeah. it's just like the, the, yeah. the flies you're tying, those are yeah. classics. Those yeah, are all classics. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then um, someone in that video used the word Nimrod. What does the word Nimrod mean? I, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, either. <laughs> Do you know what the word Nimrod means? I've looked it up before, but I don't remember. All right. We could look it up, but. Okay, I'm oh, curious yeah. about that. Um, okay, so another question I have for you is uh, in that video I watched you, you were tying an sable wolf, mm -hmm. one of the most productive flies on the Esopus Creek, uh, specifically for high, fast water. What was the tailing material you used for the sable wolf? I've used everything, but now I've kind of reverted back to what Fran Betters made it out of, a woodchuck. Woodchuck uh, tail or hair, uh, and um, you know you can use just about anything. I've used black calf tail. I've used black chicken feathers. I don't really like the fly to float too high. I like it to sink under the water. Uh huh. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then you pop that fly back up, and as soon as it pops, they hit it. Good, uh, good advice on how to catch a fish and on these soap is You can use that fly all summer long. Uh -huh. I don't care what they're hitting on, just go right in the fast water with that thing and go get those rainbows. That's been my experience. I actually use uh, elk mane for the tailing, mm -hmm. so which gives a good float. Yeah. Okay. Nimrod, Nimrod, since you asked, is a skillful hunter or an insect person? Okay. Oh, <laughs> are you both? <laughs> a little bit of both, yeah. A little okay. bit of both. Yeah. Our own local Nimrod. I'm an insect imitator. Chris has a double Nimrod. Good to, good to know. Um, okay, so um, in uh, reviewing Ray Smith's biography, and I think in, in, in one of the books he presented, mm -hmm. uh, they are saying that Ray Smith said he himself tied 12,000 flies a year. Wow. That breaks out to 1,000 a month. That breaks out to 33 a day. Wow. Is that even possible? 33 a day? That's not hard to do at all. <laughs> oh, so you want to talk about how many you do in a day? I don't do nothing like I used to. I used uh, to tie I used to tie a lot more than that. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I just, Did, when I was serious about it, now I just do it for pleasure, so. Uh, were you ever tying a thousand a month? Um, yes. Th that is prodigious. <laughs> that is prodigious. Easily. You could go through the entire uh, Beethoven oeuvre. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> those flies. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of George Jones. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay, what else? You want to talk about any of the books? Yeah, that I got you a know? couple of books. I got one book here that has a very good section of uh, Ray Smith in it called Tying Catskill Style Dry Flies by Mike Valla. And I believe it's available at the library, right? Yes. Indeed it is. And it's very good pictures in there of Ray and the flies. The photography is just phenomenal. Mark will attest to that. Then I have an old Outdoor Life magazine from 1972. It has a nice article of Ray. The Catskill Fly Tires by Cecil Heacock. And it has, shows the red fox that was raised, uh, what he was known for, dry fly. And there's one picture of Ray tying flies that is his desk in Mount Tremper where I learned how to tie. And I still have that that book I've, since 1972. I would not get rid of it. And the Red Fox was one of Ray's original uh, designs. That was one of his for signature the flies, Creek. yeah. Yeah, of which he, can you name any other of his original designs? I don't know of any, uh, other, any other ones that he made that he put his name on. I know that's the one he was known for. Uh, uh, which is also a huge fish getter in the right time of year on the Esopus Creek, the red fox. Yeah. So. No, it's a good fly. The Osceable Wolf is better. <laughs> good I don't to know. know. It's, it, for me, it's better because I can see it. it. Has the white wings on it. Uh -huh. it. If you need to know where your fly is, even if it's under the water, you can still see it. And those wings are from the tail of a calf, correct? C calf tail, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are all calf tails white? I. Uh, I don't know if they are or not because I know when I buy them, they, I buy bleached calf tails. Oh. So 
so I don't know if they're always white or not. Uh huh. Or if they bleach them whiter than what they were. But you can huh. get them and dyed in any color. Right. But they okay. work good. Right. They make yeah. a good fly. I've gone through a lot of them. But the Aus Sable Wolf, my two boys will attest to that too. That's their favorite fly. I've heard that from your son. Yeah. Yeah. My one son, all he fishes with is the three fly wet fly leader. Uh -huh. He uses that all the time. Um, when was the last time he actually hooked two fish at the same time? Not that Anytime. long ago. Oh, really? Last year. Oh, you used to hear about this all the time with these three fly rigs. Right. A fish would take one fly, he'd be swimming yeah. around, jerking the other two flies. A second fish right. would take a second fly. Yeah. That's when, never happened to me personally. Yeah. But the I'm stock the fish day. used to hit it a lot that way. Sometimes you catch three of those when they stock the stream. You know, if you got oh out God. there where they've stocked or something, three, three hookup was common. So if anybody's ever tried to pull in one of these 10 inch rain, wild rainbows <laughs> in Sopus Creek, and then imagine that times three. Right. Uh, they all want to go in a different direction. You're, you're in for a fight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't all go in the same. One wants to go this way, one wants to go that way. I guess uh, I guess all these trout have their own single-minded issues. Yeah. Just just like us people, apparently. Just like the fly fishermen that are trying to catch them. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Well, fly fishing, I think, is coming back around here. For a while there, when it's kind of in a lull around here, you never really seen that many people out fishing, but it's <clears> definitely coming back. Well, two things I can say as a guide, uh, I, I see it's definitely trending. It's trending more so amongst younger people right. than amongst women, mm -hmm. but also because of the that, whole COVID crisis. Right, that really pushed it up. Fishing is one thing we could do right. out, safely. outdoors still safely and still yeah. remain safely spaced. Yeah. And um, my personal recollection, all the guys I hear from last year was the busiest year ever, ever, ever on the Sopus Creek. Did you find that to be true? Yes. Yeah, it was, it was swamped. Definitely. And, I'd have to say all our uh, secret fly fishing holes became public yeah. public swimming holes. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. <coughs> well, you know, we not only got more people out fishing, we also there's no tubers now either. Right. A lot of people I think I might have gotten chased away by the tubers. Uh, not me, because yeah. I I use the tubers to my advantage. How does that work? Well, you figure the tubers are going down the stream all day long. They're, they're keeping the fish down. Well, I always waited till the tubers stopped at night, and then I went out, and then the fish were feeding. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's strategizing. That's I don't know skill. if it's true or not, but it seemed to work. Tricky. Okay. Well, the proof is in the results, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another little uh, tidbit of Catskill fly fishing yeah. knowledge. Yeah. So, all right. Anything else? Any other questions? No. Let, do we have any questions on, from the audience? Yes. Not yet. Okay. Well. If anyone has any questions, you can type them in the chat box. Um, I, I want to... Rooster, rooster yeah. Rooster. Yeah, that's, that's the feathers. rooster yeah. next door. It's feathers. <laughs> Most people think chicken, uh, Preston thinks feathers <laughs> when he hears that. So. Well, I um. would like to say that we're very fortunate to have Ray here who learned to tie I mean, Preston, Preston. Who learned to tie from Ray. And we have two other students of Ray's, the Hoyt cousins, Jody and Paul, who are going to talk about their experiences also on August 17th at 2.30. We'll have another Zoom presentation and continue this discussion and see what other facts we can learn from Ray's students about his secrets and his tricks. I have one other question for Preston. Um, it's, it's widely reported that uh, Ray Smith guided Babe Ruth, our favorite American hero. Is that merely a rumor or is that a fact? I don't know. <clears throat> mm, it'd be Before interesting to find out. The one uh, story I think I do know is a fact about uh, Babe Ruth is he, he did hang out around here a lot and he did fish around here. And I met one person that uh, allegedly fished with him as a child, uh, um, uh, who was Ralph Hoffman. I don't know if you ever knew Ralph Hoffman. And I wanted to interview Ralph uh, about his experiences fishing with the babe. He said, well, we never really fished with the babe. I was a young person at the time, and the babe never really fished with us, but he let us hang out with him if we carried his beer cooler. 
And that's, <laughs> that's the experience of fishing with uh, Babe Ruth. Well, I think Ray was a big baseball fan. Oh, yes, he and was. And he, he played on a local baseball yes. team. And some of these baseball people who came up here played baseball with him. Right. Right. Yeah. Ted Williams. Baby. Yeah, I know. I've seen pictures of him. He was the uh, captain or whatever of the local team. Yeah. Ray Smith was? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Good to know. Yes. Yeah, I think Cal is in the picture. Uh-huh. He was one of the players and a lot of local boys. And right. apparently the Lanesville Nine was one of the top teams around. Yeah. Oh, they were. So. The Lanesville Nine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we do have a question. Stephanie? Yeah, we didn't have any questions in the chat room, but I have a question. Okay. <laughs> um, what's your favorite fly to what's tie? What's my favorite fly and to tie? Yeah. I don't know why, but I love tying blue-winged olives. <laughs> it's just, I could sit there and tie hundreds of them. What size do you tie them in? 16, 18. Boy, it's getting tiny. Yeah, they want to be small. Yeah. Now on the creek, they come in yeah. size 20, and that's 22. that's one that pops out most of the summer, off and on, right. blue-winged olive. But well, I love tying them. Well, there's several different species that are referred to as blue-winged olive, and they hatch differently, and that's why. Uh, they can also hatch in the winter, the, the tiny, tiny, really? tiny ones, hmm. yeah. And the, the Sopus Creek, as you know, is legal fishing year-round. Right. So for the first like time that. this year. So yeah. many times we'd have nice days in the winter, I just wanted to go fishing. So you'd be out there in December, January on I a nice will, day? I will be. If, well, if the weather is nice, it's got to be warm. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't do cold anymore. <laughs> That's hardcore. <laughs> yeah. That's hardcore. I, for years and years, I chipped the ice out of the guide. I don't do that anymore. Yeah, I used to do that too, and I think I'm. I think I aged out yeah. on that. Yeah. So. Just breath. There's a question in the chat. Actually, just popped. I was about to ask a question, but here comes one. Have your granddaughters shown any interest in uh, fly tying? Um, my oldest one did for a while. She, I used to have her over there tying flies, but she doesn't now. She's 14 and. She doesn't want to do it anymore. But when she was younger, yeah, she used to sit there and do it. I let her do it. And I taught her a few things, yes. And I have a question. Preston, have you ever had the, any reason to buy a fly? Or have you made all your own <laughs> all these years? I bought Fran Better's flies when I was up in the Adirondacks just to, because they were his. But those are about the only flies I ever bought. And Fran Better's at a fly shop on the Sable Creek, yes. upstate New York, uh, and uh, was a designer of several iconic flies. The Sable Wolf. The Sable Wolf and others, I think the Haystack. Haystack the usual. and the, the usual, yeah. Um, I make both of those now. Yeah, which are very bushy, yeah. impressionistic flies, just a bunch right. of hair sticking out, really. The usual is actually all made from one material. It's all made from a rabbit's foot, snowshoe rabbit's foot. Hmm. The wings, yeah. the body, and the tail, all made from right. one thing. And a deadly fly. It, it, Go figure. Yes. Yeah. And that shows how, um, although a, a number of these fly patterns are highly realistic, it would seem that the most impressionistic ones, they don't really look like a bug, but right. as they're floating by this fish looking up in the silhouette are buggy enough that mm -hmm. it will elicit a strike. Right. Yeah. So. Well, right. thank you both very much thank you for inviting me yeah we'll we'll resume another program on august 17th with with the jody and paul hoyt who and also learned to tie from ray smith from ray smith and um this will be posted on our website catskillanglingcollection.org probably before the day is over or tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> and also on YouTube? It will yes. also be on YouTube. Yes. Okay. And uh, Preston has a very interesting uh, video on YouTube also. If you plug in Preston Wool Heater, you can see that video, which also includes a really interesting radio clip uh, with Ray Smith on the Fred Allen Radio Hour talking about mm -hmm. his, his, his guiding business in the Catskills. And he, yeah. he often guided Fred Allen and Fred Allen's radio crew. Fred Allen was a very popular radio show back in the 30s. So uh, all interesting material. So check out YouTube. Yeah, I, n I, I n never recognized the voice because that was a young Ray Smith. 
the yeah. Ray Smith I knew never had a voice like that. Now, is that because he was a heavy chain smoker? Could be. One thing I hear from the Hoyts is that he was a heavy chain smoker. Yeah. He would often cough right. and blow all the feathers off the table. <laughs> <laughs> little little yeah. piece of Catskill color. So, yeah. uh, well, thank you all very much, and thanks to those of you who are attending today's Zoom.